we'll, we'll, we'll give you um, time to do a presentation later. But we've just agreed before you jumped on that we're going to go from west to east as a as a journey. So I think that makes you about fourth. Um, An in bulk pilgrimage. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe just start with a quick intro. Um, do you want to start, um, uh, Tom or Paul? Which whoever's feeling most inclined just yeah tom you're on the screen do you what would you like to yeah say hello sure. um, cool. my name's tom thomas irvin tom irvin um i've been uh diving into compost sort of in, in terms of studying it quite deeply for the last three years and, and i had my permaculture seed awakening about eight years ago and been working out ways on how i can get involved in that for a while now so yeah um, I live in Glastonbury and i um, excited to, to meet the rest of this community. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Nice one, Tom. Thanks, dude. Perfect. Um, Paul. Hi, folks. Um, I'm probably the least knowledgeable person on the call regarding compost as I'm um, just starting on my um, voyage, shall we say. Um, met Tom the other day when I travel down to pick up a Jora, which is cooking the other side of this wall behind behind the screen here at a steady 70 at the moment. So very pleased about that. Wow. Is it? Um, all to try and start to produce a decent amount of compost, learn how to do it properly before I launch into a proper community and potentially commercial um, small scale, obviously, uh, production and to feed the market garden that I'm looking to kick off very soon. So yeah, so here Great. to learn as much as possible. Wicked. Perfect. Um, that's great. Thanks, guys. And then excellent. We've got Sophie and a Joanna too. Hi, Joanna. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, yeah. I think we could we could we could start. We'd, we we've we've um we'd, well, should we should we do a, a quick intro for everyone just to re recap? Um or how do how do people feel about go that? On, yeah, no, it's good. Go on. Yeah, go on. Good. Yeah, and tell me we'll get each other's names and places a bit better. Wicked. Nikki, you're on the screen. Fire away. Oh, okay. Uh well I'm Nikki Scott, obviously. Um I've been composting for a very long time. Uh, since I was 16, so about 60 years, so no, not that long, 50 years. Um, I've written a few books on composting. I, we, I was the chair of the Community Composting Network, and I've re I'm going to talk about how we've restarted the Composting in the Community Network, as it's now been renamed later. Yeah. Amazing. Hannah and Soph, do you want to tag it together? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, me and Soph are part of a team of five doing um, Hay on Why, Hey I Got Worms, um, otherwise known as Hay Regenerative Soils. And um, we set up in April, we contacted Tom in April um, last year, so it's almost a year. Um, but we've just been taking our time getting money together and getting things sorted, set up a community um, collection in hay and um, yeah then to sell the compost eventually and but we are just about to start actually doing it so yeah exciting times okay. nice one perfect and uh, Danny hey everyone I'm Danny um, based in Bristol and we're just about to start up Bristol Living Soil and yeah the journey sort of really started uh, listening to sort of Tom's inspirational messages via Instagram and you know other means and uh, thinking god that needs to spread and uh, getting Tom to host a little talk online actually because it was during lockdown um, in Bristol um, and um, yeah I think some of you came along to that so it all kicked off last year for us and since then we've been sort of slowly really kind of like building a structure which I'll talk more about um, later. Great stuff thanks Danny great um and then we've got a cat <laughs> hi cat uh, hi i'm cat i am just outside glasgow um i'm doing my permaculture diploma just now and yeah i run a, a community food growing incredibly edible thing up here um, and trying to create a community compost club as well at some point as part of that 
Wicked. Perfect. Thanks, Kat. And um, uh, Peter, would you like to go? Sure. I'm going to talk a bit more later about what we're doing, what I'm doing with a, with a ride um, and now, but I've also had experience now of um, uh, both uh, Jorahs and Rydans in Froome, uh, which is where I'm sitting. Um, and I've been, I've, so I've been making traditional compost for not quite as long as Nikki, I should say, but pretty close, sort of 60 <laughs> years or something. Um, I make bloody lovely compost. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've only ever done it in my own garden with a fork. And so I'm uh, inspired by Tom and, and, um, and the whole Brighton scene. I've gone down a, a different adventure, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. Nice one. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. And um, Joanna, would you like to say hello for us? Yeah, hello. I'm in Brighton and I first got involved, I think, because I ordered some compost off Tom. And then I just started asking Tom loads of questions and then started to learn all, the, all about this. So I'm, I'm a gardener and allotment person, but um, I feel like I've just... Yeah, started to become a better grower through understanding some of the science of this and lovely to join this community. Brilliant. Thanks, Joanna. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so that's uh, absolutely great to have you here. I'm, I'm, uh, Tom and I have um, had a lot of um, kind of most most transformative experiences I've had, I found since um, moving to Brighton, where I kind of like became ecologically motivated um, were with community gardens and um, that's where I sort of realized there was a great need for compost and I, I've done a lot of pro uh, uh, projects over the years to try and create more of that scene um, and had some yeah the best results that I've had has always have, have been with with compost but making the, the Jura compost was the big one when I had like my Jack in the Beanstalk moment and um, that uh, that's that sort of started the, the the planted the seed for what like then became compost club, and um, and then and then we I did the soil food web thing and then I realised quite how badly I've been underselling my compost or not 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 even valuing it enough just like like yeah just because it's half half of the work of compost is moving it you know half of it's making it but half of it's moving it um, yeah I hadn't I'd, I'd I'd done a huge, I'd made about five tons of amazing compost once and I sold it to someone for like a hundred quid. <laughs> so, ah. so bad. And now I found out <laughs> it could have been worth like a thousand pounds a ton if it had all the fungi in it, which I'd seen loads of mushrooms growing in it. And so, yeah, that, that kind of like, I, I partly like, I just think this is such a powerful tool now for, yeah, giving, putting power back in people's hands and, and in making them better gardeners and, um, yeah, I just think compost is the 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 mo the kind of most thing that can make such a difference to our local ecology and economies. Um, if we sort of yeah take it, we kind of reclaim it and 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 relearn about all the biology that actually makes it good. That's that's kind of what my biggest obsession is at the moment. So yeah, it's it's brilliant to have you guys um, here and um, to be sharing this journey with you. So. Um, yeah, we've got a new plan to start from the west of England to um, to the to the to the furthest um, furthest climbs to the west, all the way across to the east. So I'm just going to try and do that on the top of my head. That's going to go Nikki, who's in Chagford. Then it's going to go Hannah and Soph, who are in Hay and Wye. Then it's going to come down a bit to Danny and Bristol. Then it's going to go to Tom in Glastonbury maybe or maybe tom and danny then we'll go to um oh it's going to be impossible to get you in cat geographically from the north but <laughs> <laughs> um although we've only got a few we've only got five six presenters today so we'll we'll start with um yeah we'll, we'll go we'll go from there and then um and then i'll jump on um towards the end down here in the east and here we've got matt great matt's tuned in wicked Okay, um, so yeah, without further ado, Nikki, would you like to tell us, please, because we really want to know about it, about the community compost? Yeah, yeah um, of course. Um, did you want me to talk about the Jean Pan stuff as well? Because I have got a few slides. I've got just six slides I put together today. For sure. But I'd have, I'd have to share, you'd have to make me a host or be able to share screen. I can totally do that. I can totally do that. <clears throat> How about now? Can you share screen now? Uh, oh, 
Uh, yep. Brilliant. Yeah. Can you, uh, hang on, can you see that or can you see the screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why is it not, um, hang on, I need to go. That's better, isn't it? Is that better? That's it. That's it. Uh, so that, um, but whilst, um, just before that, before I just got a few slides here, but I'll just briefly recap. So about a year ago, um, as I said in my introduction, I used to chair the Community Composting Network, which was a national network. I mean, other people chaired it as well. I was just on, on the board and we shared the chairing of it over many years. And a few years ago, it, it folded up. We, we put in a a grunt fig, um, well, we had a big funding bid um, to, to um, we produced a manual for um, compost growing, compost making for local food growers. And we were doing training on that. So we've got a whole training manual we put together, but I think the um, the putting of all that together really burned out the, the crew doing it. And so there was quite a big burnout and there's a lot, when, when you get more and more money from these things, you have to do more and more accounting back and it just sort of wiped people out rather. Anyway, the, the, the network sort of fizzled out. And then during the lockdown, I was getting, because I used to, to, to coordinate the Devon networks. So we had a separate network just in Devon. And there's lots of community groups that I helped set up down here. Um, and then I got made redundant. The, the national network folded. And then during the lockdown, I um, rang up Ian Eggington Metters, who, who founded the Federation of uh, City Farms and Community Gardens, which is now called social farm garden and said i'm getting loads of people contacting me with with uh, wanting to find out about composting well peter you got in touch with me at that time didn't you and quite a lot of other people um connected up with me and i was helping them and i said hey why don't we just you know get it go get something going again and ian retired and he had so he had a bit more time so we now have the composting we've renamed it composting in the community network which we felt was slightly more include, bit more inclusive. And we've got all the resources from the old CCN that have been taken back in hand by social farms and gardens. And in fact, I had most of them myself on my computer. So we've got quite a good resource bank uh, of books and articles and you know um, manuals and all sorts of useful resources and films and bits and pieces that are on my web, uh, website as well. So we, we now meet sort of once every month or six weeks. We've just put in a big uh, funding application um, through the John Lewis Fund for £300,000 if we get it on uh, circular food and food waste. Amazing. Uh, that will be to, to run projects in Liverpool and, and London. Um, particularly around Limehouse in London, uh, on the Tevia estate. And if we get that money, the, the, hopefully that will be an exemplar that we can then uh, leverage more projects because uh, I would really love to do the same in Plymouth because I'm working with projects in Plymouth. And, you know, people like you, Tom and Peter, and lots of you on this call actually have got potential to to get more projects going and, and particularly we're particularly interested in linking sort of food poverty with uh, you know composting food, growing food empowering people to grow food you know all those kind of issues which all come together under the umbrella of community composting mm -hmm. so that's the composting in the community network so it's kind of held by social farms and gardens um, so that's great because that's a vehicle. So they're a registered charity and a 40 years experience and bloody blah, blah. So if you're going for funding and you run it through them, you know, it's a, it's a very good way of, of helping, you know, they, they can really help do it. We have a, a Facebook group, which you're all welcome to join. There's only two questions to answer. One is that you, to tell us what you're actually doing something and two to agree by the rules. So I'm just saying that because someone's just, applied to become a member but they haven't ticked the box that says yes i agree to abide by the rules so it's be quite nice if you agree to abide by the rules which is just to be courteous really that's all uh, but several people have asked to join and i've had um, i write i write to them all individually and usually i don't know they don't reply so anyway um
so that would be good so facebook group we haven't got a, a website as such yet Nikki, right? sorry to um uh hurry you up did you have some slides for us that that, that was really good yeah. for intro but um we've got to get uh, everyone in yeah sorry yeah you want to get a lot done the the then there's been these conversations on uh getting heat from compost so i just put this it's only six slides so here we go we we developed so this, Aaron, this is DEFRA and the Environment Agency visiting our project. Many, it was a, this is when foot and mouth started. We had been uh, composting food waste. The gray tower on the right behind that guy in the glasses head is two uh, chest freezers bolted together to make a kind of insulated tube on legs with what, what Aaron, who's on the left, who, who designed and built these, um, called the um, uh, a harvester at the bottom. So you kind of preload it with some compost and then you um, it heats up you then you add your food waste and wood chip and, and everything and, and, and it will come go fall through by gravity and be harvested at the bottom. The one on the left was the was a bigger bigger obviously one. Uh, the stuff didn't block inside so easily. You can see he's built a little chimney for airflow. There were there was actually you could record the temperature on it and all the rest of it, and so that was what he called the TARDIS, uh, and that was Defra when uh, the animal byproducts legislation came in to to talk to us about whether we could carry on using it. They said no. Uh, sadly, we gave it away to the Woolly Monkey Sanctuary in uh, Cornwall so that they could at least use it because it falls outside the legislation. Uh, this was some part of our thinking on how you how you could uh, separate the clean and dirty, as they called it, you know, with animal byproducts. You had to be able to show how the stuff that was coming in, which was could be potentially contaminated, would be separated from the clean kind of harvesting area. So that was a schematic to show how, you know, you could screen it off um, and work it separately. Um, and then Jean Pan, who this is the, the conversation about getting heat from your compost. Um, Jean Pan, who is the French pioneering composter, and there's now that in Belgium there's the Comité Jean Pan, uh, where they trial out these, they, they they experiment with this stuff. And he heated his house with these big piles of the Jean Pan, big piles of brushwood, chipped up brushwood with alkathene pipe, getting very very big. Um, that's how big they are, kind of, you can see it <laughs> against a truck, that's the size of it. So my thinking was to try and, and go back to the, the blue one there and make um, and, and actually use that kind of technology, run the pipes within an insulated layer. Uh, so the pipes would be nearest the compost and then all insulated up behind it so that you could feed cold water in the bottom, take hot water off at the top and um, heat, heat up your, your water, but within a continuous throughput, because the, the downside of the Jean Pan system is that once you've, you've, you've done all, all that, you then have to pull it all apart again mm. every time uh, mm. with a tractor or you know, generally with a tractor, it's a lot of work with, with uh, forks and things. So that was his system. There's a there's a lot more to it because he's actually extracting methane off as well. But the main part of it was just hot uh, cold water in and hot water out. Thank you so much, Nikki. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, nice one. And 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 you've already shared those plans with Peter, who who might be up to do something in the the new reuse centre at Froome, which I'm sure. Well, it'd be great. It would be great to have it actually happening. I love that. Yeah. Wicked. That's so, that's so good. So um. Great. Next up, we have uh, it's 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 Luke. It's uh, Hannah and Sophie. There you go. Uh, hey. <laughs> okay. So, can you uh, see that beautiful yeah. logo? Yes, got it. Let's Lovely. go. So that is Sophie's beautiful um, work there. Um, it's the all seeding eye um, of our logo, and um, yeah, we're hey we we got worms, um, which is a quote from Sophie. What film? Oh my God, <laughs> uh, dumb and dumber. Jim Carrey <laughs> says it when he's trying to build a worm farm. <laughs> oh, right. So um, we're, um, our official name is Hey Regenerative Soils when we want to be all professional and stuff. And we just registered the kick. Um, oh, come on. So um, this is a bit, a bit of a random a kind of model that we put together. Um, we started thinking about Hey We Got as a kind of umbrella um, for um, 
our brand or our, our organization. Um, but really, we're really just starting out. So I'm going to take you on that journey, but we haven't got any facts about compost at all um, because we haven't even made any yet. <laughs> um, but we're going like two feet in really soon. Um, but essentially, um, we're, we're kind of um, thinking that we will um, get into the flow of making this living soil, really good soil and compost, um, and um, that we'll eventually start using that compost for a market garden. So. Soph um, introduced um, us to an amazing um, kind of uh, wildlife camping spot and they've been great to us. They've offered us um, a, a bit of land to grow a market garden basically and start a veg box. So that's like, like our long-term ambition, but we're really just starting out. So um, this is the first bit. So we started um, just working out whether there was interest in this in hay um, and if people were up for it there's already a collection power to already do a, a food waste collection so we're a bit like hearing that maybe it might not be a good thing um, again sophie's amazing work guardians of the soil is a film that's on video um on vimeo sorry um which um so put together um for a, a completely separate project but is about the importance of soil um, and it's quite a kind of well so if you say about what the... I mean it's just a bit of a ritualistic performance piece of um, four archetypes of the soil uh, mourning the death of the topsoil we we lose yearly um, so we kind of used I like to say we used it to get people into this hall lock the doors and then talk to them about the importance of composting and what we wanted to do um, but it was really good. So loads of people came for the film and then we ended up having loads of people interested, wanting to sign up, wanting us to collect their food waste and wanting to be involved in the community project. So, I mean, it was a way to kind of just, I mean, we tried to speak about um, getting people together for a compost club meeting, but it didn't seem to hit off. So I felt like this was a, a nice trick yeah, to get people in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and people are really up for it. There's a, obviously hay is a book town, so there's a lot of cardboard coming out hay. So one day we'll be able to collect it all and shred it if we ever make a shredder. <laughs> um, so we um, needed to raise some cash to get our first tumbler, and so we um, we had a benefit gig and a raffle. Um, that's our friend Joanna um, Warren, who's an amazing uh, performing well. Uh, a recording artist and we had loads of amazing donations of um, artwork and things from people around Hay who wanted to get involved and support us. So we made um, we made a thousand pounds off everything bar as well. We made um, soil themed cocktails as well. <laughs> um, and um, I'm going to play a little bit of this, not all of it, but the climate choir wrote this song for us. So good. You get the picture. So I won't go all the way through that. But um, yeah, so we had um, lots of performances and it was a fab night. Oops. How do I go across now? Oh, oh yeah. So, um, so we went and bought the tumbler, um, which arrived around Christmas time. Thank you, Tom, for putting on all the effort to get it to us. And we picked it up. Um, and then a massive storm came and the pe lovely people at the wildlife campsite that had offered us completely for free access to water, an enormous mm -hmm. shed um, that was, you know, completely covered, perfect access, all the Oh stuff. no, it's frozen. Oh, am I frozen? I've got you. Okay. Um, it blew down in the storm. <laughs> that is the middle picture is the woodshed. So um, we went to go visit them and they were like, okay, don't worry. It's all right. We'll just do something temporary for a while and that you maybe will give you a horse box. They've got loads of horses and a stud farm and stuff. So um, yeah, they've been amazing. And so we put the tumbler together um, last weekend um, in a cold rain um, and uh, yeah, made a stupid film of us, very excited about it, which I'll show you a little bit of. 
<laughs> Herbert Slapstick. Yeah. <laughs> um, and oh, damn it. Hang on. And then, um, yeah, so uh, that was last weekend and um, we have just registered as a kick. We decided to go with a kick instead of a, a community benefit society, which we were looking at for ages and ages. And I think would have been a really good model, but it was just, it, it posed so many more obstacles yeah. when we were just about to like get going and it was just taking so long. Um, we just went for the path of least resistance. Um, and decided that we could change that model, um, the structure later, um, when we've got more people on board and things like that, because it relies a lot on creating mm. a group of members to then elect the directors, and it was a bit full okay. on for us. So we're excited to get the um, the kick registered, and today we've got I've just put in an application for a bank account, well, so we can yeah. actually take some money, um, mm. which is really exciting, and um, we have. Um, Put out, we've got a newsletter that goes out um, whenever anything fun happens and um, we've put out a newsletter asking for sign-ups and we've got probably about six um, households signed up now um, and we we originally intended to go like five miles in a radius around Hay but that's kind of masses of distance right away with a, a bike potentially so we the green area is where we're concentrating on and um, we, a local um, cycle company, uh, Drover's Cycles, got in touch and said, would you um, take our food waste and we can provide you with a trailer? So um, we're doing an exchange until maybe they'll sell it, maybe we can buy it off them in instalments. But it's a really good one, we think. And we haven't used it yet. So and we've got to make a frame and that's that at the bottom. Brilliant. That so, looks like a perfect frame for yeah. compost that's absolutely ideal yeah it's really robust. you won't get yeah i'm, I'm making i'm using one at the moment but I'm, I, I rely on taking it on the train which is like oh, a wow. quarter of the size of that but i can fit three compost buckets on it um wow, that's 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 quite a mission because we we that's 12 squares on that one so we wondered if we could just put the buckets in the squares <laughs> that would be amazing we've got square buckets that we're using um so we're gonna we're We've just um, going to kind of load up the compost compost tumbler with our own waste and that from a business locally, um, and then start collecting that once we set up direct debit and that kind of business, which is nice. a bit of a complex absolutely thing. amazing work, Hannah, and so so yeah. so inspiring how quickly you've done all that. It's great. Um, these are our questions, but I think they're probably well, not. I, I screen grabbed them too. I thought maybe we could um, just run those run through them with. Um, with Nikki at the end, and uh, and, and me and, and anyone else who, who and Peter who feel knowledgeable about them, who's put them through tumblers and done answered all that stuff um, through through experience. So yeah, let's have a chat about them at the end. All right, amazing. Thank you. Nice one, guys. That's absolutely wicked. And on to Danny in Bristol. Hey, hey, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Cool, I'll try and share my screen, bear with me. Got it. You got it, okay, Yeah, cool. beautiful. Sweet. So, um, yeah, so I'm arriving at this in a sort of slightly different place, maybe to, to most people. Um, I don't have much experience making compost. Uh, you know, I always just myself made it in the back garden, but didn't really kind of think too much of it other than just like chucking the kind of um, sort of, you know, food waste in there. Um, you know, knew some things about kind of like balance, like too many onions and citrus peel and all that kind of stuff that, that you know, you sort of get whispered, but you don't really understand. I never really understood it. Um, but my background is more sort of like social permaculture. And I was involved with Coexist. I was a co-director. We ran Hamilton House, which is a big community center. And we're really interested in sort of growing community and, and growing sustainable communities. And one thing that Coexist always wanted to do was to have a sort of twin project in the countryside. Now, many of you might know that that building no longer is run by Coexist. 
and has been co-opted um, by sort of commercial interests. Um, but Coexist is actually just about to um, sort of like launch its own sort of re sort of community building project. Um, and I teach social permaculture or so, some aspects of social permaculture on um, the Shift Bristol course. So for me, this kind of was really, really exciting to sort of get a little bit more practical. And it was through um, sort of Co-Resist, which is an arts activism and sort of facilitation or education um, collective that um, I run, which is actually a, a seed project of, of Coexist um, that I um, sort of launched that talk last year um, with Tom um, composting to, to heal the earth. So that's sort of like the origin story and the kind of angle that I've kind of come at this um, from, which I think is kind of important because, um, yeah, you'll see what we've been doing over the last year. So, yeah, the, the sort of working name was Bristol Living Soil Cooperative. I think we're just going to go with Bristol Living Soil because actually we're not sure that it is going to be a cooperative. Similar to you, Hannah, you know, we think the kick might be the sort of most versatile structure. Uh, we really wanted to sort of do something which was um, which really enshrined cooperative values. Um, and we have been working with some incredible people to sort of explore governance structure. And um, yeah, I'll come more on, on to that in a moment. But one of, the, um, one of the biggest challenges over the last um, year has actually been securing a site. I mean, I couldn't believe like how difficult it was. Now we've had some amazing offers, but we really wanted one that was quite local to us because we didn't want to be traveling kind of quite far away to then sort of generate, um, you know, contacts in a neighborhood that we kind of weren't really a part of. Um, and so for us, it was important that it was going to be, um, you know, Bristol, St. Werberg, St. Paul's, Eastern sort of area. Um, and they're all kind of like quite closely linked. Now, eventually we, we um, actually, it was only last week we got a final sign off from St. Werberg City Farm for um, our um, location. And it's involved Bristol City Council, St. Werberg City Farm, the St. Werberg's Allotment Association, and loads of kind of like independent people as well. So it really is a community building exercise, this. Um, and so, yeah, sort of drawing on lots of experience sort of navigate the patience that's been required. Uh, lo almost lost hope on a number of occasions. I've just been like, I can't even bother with this, but um, everyone else has been, you know, really supportive and great. So that's really cool. Um, we have also been applying for funding in that time. Uh, Nikki, it was really interesting to hear you saying you went for this um, funding, so did we. And uh, for a small um, pot of money though, for only half of what um, you applied for, it'd be really interesting to compare notes. Um, I don't think our application was as good as it, it could have been. Um, mainly because that's not my skill set and I wasn't able to um, get the support that I wanted because I had COVID and was totally wiped out for sort of like four weeks prior to, to the deadline. Um, but yeah, so we are really kind of interested in the kind of like the circular economy. So not just kind of like the circular economy um, of nutrients within the system, but also kind of the, um, the, the sort of uh, monetary economy as well so that people, our membership will be able to kind of like save money by receiving compost, which is hopefully you know, be, going to be of greater value than the kind of membership um, uh, fees that they pay. Tom, you were talking about the, the real value of compost earlier, and that's something that we really want to build into the consciousness from the very, very beginning. Um, we have also applied for this kind of test fund um, so that we can um, look at the governance structure and really work out um, a way that this can be inclusive because we want the members to be really active in the governance but we also want the people who are going to be kind of actually delivering and working um, in the sort of compost in Bristol Living Soil and the Compost Collective um, to have a, a, a kind of I guess a bit more um, sort of a say on how things are run and so I'm really interested in these things. Uh, we were successful. We got this uh, pot of money the other day. Um, and um, and now, yeah, we've got a, like a, a few weeks really to kind of like really explore this um, and work out how we can really de democratize this process and so not just kind of rebuilding our soils, but re rebuilding our community as we sort of emerge out of the pandemic. And, and the reason why this is really important um, is because the aim of, of what we're doing is not just to sort of create one um, sort of compost collective, which, you know, which has been so brilliantly pilot, piloted already, um, but to sort of create a network of them. Um, and so the governance structure has to really reflect that. Um, so that's sort of really based on this, on this, on the kind of fact that, you know, the compost, the community composting, you can only generate 10 tons of, of compost. 
um, sort of outside and you know without getting extra licenses and you know cover and all the rest of it. So um, if we have a network of them across the city, each doing up to 10 tons, sharing kind of like things like governance structures, resources, um, uh, you know, and being able to support each other, then we've, we've got the real opportunity to kind of grow this at scale. And that's what really excites me at least, and a few others as well that are involved because we'd like to make a real systemic impact in the city. Um, so each kind of group, once it's established, you know, say it's been established for a year, it can then support uh, another one and buddy up with them. So, you know, potentially we can sort of double each year according to capacity and, you know, the ability to secure sites and the initial seed funding for each one. Um, yeah, the government, the, the kind of the practical aspects of it all needs to be as inclusive um, and accessible as, in, as possible. We really want to build a really great sort of diversity across um, the membership and that's, you know, going to be reflected in um, some um, membership plans which are completely free um, so that we can always make sure marginalised people will have access to really great um, living soil too. And we have, are partnering up with um, Griffin, Growing Real Food for um, Nutrition, um, who are going to be helping um, us really understand um, the sort of nutrient levels of the produce which is created from the compost. Um, we're going to be monitoring kind of like soil quality, obviously, but also the kind of um, the nutrient value of, of the um, vegetables that are grown as well. And that hopefully will be part of a national um, study, which is um, sort of taking place as well. So that's really exciting. And we can look at, you know, how we're addressing food poverty in the city, because food poverty isn't just about access to healthy food. It's, you know, actually understanding that, you know, food, the food itself um, needs to have like high nutrient levels as well. So. Yeah, that's kind of like where we're, where we're coming from on this. Um, and we're just um, really at the stage now where um, having secured that funding, having secured the site, things are just starting to click into place. It's really weird how we just met so much resistance, you know, for a little while and now things are unfolding really well. So that's pretty cool. We have um, transport um, for our uh, compost buckets uh, through uh, electric rickshaws. And we also have, we're working with a couple of people who've got, got precarious um, jobs. So for them, it, it kind of will be fantastic to be able to have like a, a, a regular gig collecting um, food waste and um, helping sort of with compost technician, compost technician work. So it's really sort of like trying to be a big social project as well as, you know, looking at the kind of ecological side of this. Um, and that's that's where we're at now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Looking forward to actually getting amazing. your hands dirty. Yes, Danny, thank you. That was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I'm really glad you're hearing here. You're working with Griffin too, because um, yeah, they've they've we've got a connection. Fair, um, Fairs Market Garden. Um, they've been they've got their they've got their uh, their reader their, you know what's it called bricks meter, um, which is the first tool, um, for that. So that's really interesting. Doing um yeah, vegetable vegetable testing with this compost, um, compost powered, uh, food production will be really valuable across the network so yeah thanks for mentioning that um amazing so now i think we're on to peter and Froome. Are you up for it peter are you ready for us uh you've you've just messed up the west east because glastonbury is definitely west of us if you want to go oh there first. damn it well in that case well i can't i can't can't break the system you're you we, you you go next then tom i think that'll be good you go next keep it Keep it true. True. Nice one. All right. So, um, just uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. That was uh, it's great to meet you all um, and to hear what you're getting up to, Danny. That's really interesting that uh, you're taking on the, uh, the the living soil, um, the whole brand, that whole um, logo. I think it's just great that this uh, this movement is like a fractaling mycelial movement. If we can all sort of um come from the same specimen cut from the same cloth kind of thing i think it's a, a really great thing so and yeah peter and nikki um great to hear what you're you're getting up to as well and um so yeah basically i um i share a little bit about my uh my journey with soil ecology lab and how i how i got there um essentially the the idea with this um, startup company was that it was based on a green waste site 
And um, I suppose before, before I get into that, um, I'll just talk about how I got into compost. It was essentially um, having lived in London, I studied music there. I realized how um, sort of disconnected with food systems um, you, you can be living in the city. So I ended up moving, I sold all my um, music gear. And just in the meantime, I sort of, I started working for Lush and they paid, they really kindly paid for a, um, a permaculture course for me. The idea was to integrate permaculture principles into manufacturing. Um, and so I was working in the factories and trying to sort of implement these, you know, the principles of permaculture. It didn't really turn out as well as um, the ideas. It's sort of implementation is always a different thing. But um, very grateful to have received that, that sort of education from Lush. So they're a good company on many levels. And um, I ended up moving to Glastonbury after I... Uh, left Lush simply because I got fed up of um, sort of trying to get everyone on the same page. There was lots of people sort of still throwing rubber gloves in the compost pile, in the compost bins. So it was it was kind of tough. Um, so I started growing food in Glastonbury and had some contacts that sort of allowed me to get on with looking after their land there. And it was sort of like community gardens. And I noticed a a real kind of lack of understanding on what was good compost. There was all these sort of weird ideas that sort of made half sense and no one really knew why they were doing things, but, oh, that's because that's what they say we should do. And the, the thing that got me was we just didn't know what, what made compost good. You know, it, it, is it because it smells good? Is it because it kind of feels good? What's actually in it that, that make, makes it good? And I was really looking into that and frustrated with the lack of general understanding of what is compost. Oh, it's just broken down organic matter, but oh, it's microbes, but what microbes and how much of them and what ratios and what kind of composts are good for different plants. And, and then essentially I, I started looking into, well, I suppose the book was teeming with microbes. Um, my curiosity led me down into into reading about it because the people around me couldn't answer the questions and um i discovered elaine ingham she wrote the forward of that book and i started looking into what she has to offer and then um yeah essentially um, okay. did you did you have some slides for us or I, I i do have some pictures they're not slides they're just pictures of what we were getting up to but well that's um, cool maybe um yeah. Yeah, do share, do share. So we've got time. I'll share that. So I'll speed the story forward. So essentially, I, um, after coming back from New Zealand, I got locked down there. I had five months in New Zealand, um, which was only meant to be a three week trip. And that just gave me a whole load of time to um, really dive into um, soil and compost and super grateful for that opportunity to like, really expose myself to a whole bunch of amazing experts that we have. Um, a lot of them are coming out of America and um, that's kind of where I got my inspiration from. Like people, people like Zach Bush gave me a good philosophical foundation on why it's important to have good soil and the importance of um, the, 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 your health and being able to grow sort of food that's complete in amino acid profiles. So we tend to lack that in conventional agricultural foods like cereal grains, like the corn, wheat, rye, barley, oats. Um, they, they, they're generally lacking in those, in five of the nine amino acids. You can look into what Zach Bush has to say about that. But anyway, from Zach Bush, I was reintroduced to Elaine Ingham again. And I was like, wow, okay, maybe I got to study this stuff. So the moment I got back from New Zealand, I bought a microscope before I'd even bought the soil food web course, um, before I even yeah, got into that, I was playing around with an OMAX microscope and just looking at what made like old soils, which is why I love your name so much, old tree soil. It's um, there's something going on with old forest soils. And I was really interested in that. And then I got some advice from Daniel on which microscope to choose. So, for those of you who don't know, Daniel is the 
uh, founder and CEO of Soil Ecology Lab, um, a company based in Odiham near Basingstoke. Um, he was looking for funding at the time I contacted him and kept me in mind when he got the funding. So he contacted me, got about, mm, I don't know, 130 grand something. Um, it was investment. So essentially started working over there. I moved, I dropped everything. I started working for Daniel and there was a team of four of us. So Adam was already working with Daniel and then Luca and I joined. So Tom, I'm going to have to speed you up a tiny bit. If you could share the slide right. with us. Sorry, dude, just because um, I know Danny's got to go at seven and I really want him to hear a bit of what Peter's got to say about the carbon. Fair enough. Thing. Okay, let's do this. Um, if I can just pull these pictures up and then I'll get it up on the shared screen. Awesome. So um, what was really lacking with the soil food web approach in the UK at least was um, actual trials. So trials on agricultural fields. And we really wanted to prove the concept um, on arable land. So that's like barley, spring barley or winter wheat or just conventional crops that are being grown on a huge scale. And so we wanted to prove Elaine's concepts her approach, the soil food web approach. And so we, um, we went about setting up a trial on the farm that we were based on. If I can share my screen. Yes, great. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Right, so this is us on the field that we um, were doing a trial on. They were about 120 meter long strips, six meters wide. And the way we did it was we had four um, experimental strips sandwiched by the rest of the field, which was conventional. Um, so they were spraying uh, nitram, which is an ammonium nitrate fertilizer, and they were desiccating with glyphosate. So the field was not in a good way. Um, and we, we were looking at uh, the compaction layers and penetrometers showed that it was really, really bad, you know, like 300 PSI only about 10 centimeters down. So um, we were kind of like level a thousand, you know, <laughs> the, the trying to extract biology from compost and spray it onto fields that were literally like, ugh, not in a good way. So we did the control strip, which was just water out of the sprayer. And then we had, um, we had a biological strip, then control, then biological, and then we had a biological strip next to the conventional, and then we had a control next to the conventional. The idea was that we wanted to be fair so that the overspray um, didn't in interfere with the results or we could see if the overspray was affecting the results. And essentially we went around and harvested uh, these quadrants. So 10 quadrants per strip. And I would not recommend going about doing it this way. Um, I certainly won't be doing it. Uh, experimenting with conventional fields this way again it took took a long time and it was backbreaking uh, backbreaking labor but essentially what we found was when we um, harrowed was it is it called harrow no no when we um, when we separated the wheat from the chaff um, the barley sorry we found that we got 88 percent of the conventional yield from the biology, bio, biological spraying. So essentially the best case scenario of our experiment was that we got 88%. So that's a drop in 12% from conventional spraying. And we weren't all too pleased with the actual biology that we were spraying. So this is um, kind of like the setup we were using. This tank over here is um, the IBC at the bottom. We had a, uh, a manifold, if I can bring that up for you, you might be able to see what that looks like. Um, so this has got a whole bunch of holes in it drilled. And we are pumping uh, air through this as like a compressed air, air compressor. And you can see the little notch there to get around that bump in the IBC tank. And so the idea was that we were brewing these compost teas. We had about 900 liters of it on the go. And 
to be honest, at the end of it, when we measured the, the extract, it wasn't as good as we'd hoped because we'd gotten better in other compost teas that we were doing. And when we'd sprayed out, we were like, oh, well, it's not that great, but it's, it's really promising, right? So we essentially, the, we got a really high yield for a compost tea that wasn't even that good in our eyes and we knew we could do better and it was just pressure the, the management none of us are really farmers we don't come from a farming background um but we had the opportunity to to attempt this trial that's and, um, awesome so yeah essentially so good. That, Did, kind of con con conclu conclusion tom so you basically yeah it, basically you got a big a, a, a lot of a higher yield from a team you, you got a pretty high yield and it's just really promising, right? There's, there's obviously, we, we did a lot more. We came up with um, methods on, of extracting compost and sort of keeping it sort of fairly stable, stable enough to send it to people. Um, and that's for people like uh, us, for example, who want to make good compost. Um, we want to sort of kickstart the compost or make it complete, bio-complete mm. in domains, um, terms. We called it the goop because it had this goop-like consistency. Um, let's see if I can pull up a picture. I've got a slide about the goop I'll share later. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. Because we've done some applications of it on like, uh, yeah, backyard compost scale. So yeah, that was absolutely great, Tom. Thanks so much, dude. That's that's brilliant. A really cool. good insight into the sort of, yeah, the brewing of the of the life and uh, applying it on a farm scale. It's super Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, to, hard to squeeze it in. Sorry, I feel a bit unprepared. For a ten minute conversation, it's it's um, always amazing how lift like how yeah how short like time how fast time flies okay. when you're trying to tell stories, man. But yeah, <laughs> thank you, that was great. Um, Peter, over to you. Without further ado, mate. So you've got a carbon calculator to share, which you've. I invented. have. I just want to just shoot through the sort of which I'll do quickly because I know you want to move fast. Let me see if I can just do a quick what what loop is, and then I'll. Share. So is that shared? You're sharing screen. Yeah, got it. Uh, I've, got, I've, got, I've got two screens, so for a start, I'm looking sideways, which is a bit annoying, but also uh, I'll, I'll do this really quickly. So uh, you, you'll get the crap at the top as well, I'm afraid, but um, there you go. So um, for years, I've wanted to capture the um, food, so-called waste in Froome in some way or other. I knew about what Tom was doing and others in Brighton and thought, hey, we'll do a Brighton, we'll do a compost club. And then I realised that a bit like um, the uh, um, someone from Hay, um, I think, so you might mention just earlier, we've got we've got soil, we've got um, a waste collection. So it's never going to work doing domestic food collection. Um, so uh, that, we don't really need that. That's just me and doing foodie things. Um, so I'd wanted to find a way to do this. And then there's a group in Froome, an organisation called Adventure, who work with young people, and they um, agreed that they would sort of take on uh, creating a, 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 the model, if you like. So they spent this group, not the mayor at the back. Um, who's the large dude, the, um, all the, the, the others at the front spent uh, 10 weeks basically working out how we might run a commercial collection of food waste in Froome um, and then, uh, and, and um, yeah, how, how that might, might, might be made to work. Um, uh, so which was really for them, it's, it, for them it's about learning how to set up a social enterprise. Um, for the customer, which was effectively me, uh, or, and by then I'd set up a community interest company, so um, Froome Community Int Froome Compost CIC, um, that you know was a customer for them working out how to do it, um, and a number of them, particularly Ben, who's in the middle there, has has remained very involved. The others have have gone on to do other things. Um, in in that photo, but also in other ones, you'll see um, Froome. Uh, there's a guy called another Tom who builds these, which are um, uh, Cycles Maximus um, uh, electric trikes, which I'm a, an enormous fan of. Um, I've got three, um, which bomb around through uh, delivering bread and um, delivering other things. Um, and then one of them, the one on the top left is the compost trike. And you can see they, they carry large quantities of things. So it's, it's a whole move up. This is sort of half a ton of, of stuff you can, you can um, move around. So we started with a Jura, which was in my garden, which I played with, um, essentially, uh, which was absolutely fine until I, started, I, I got excited about it getting really hot. And, I put, and at the same time, unfortunately, two things happened. One was a large quantity of meat and also summer. Um, 
at which point, point my neighbours used a word which I hadn't heard for a long time, well, actually for many centuries, miasma, you know, which is basically the spreading of a smell, which was sort of, it, it did create the most awful smell. I don't recommend, um, you know, meat and hot summer and, and, and jurors. Um, I mean, maybe any compost there. Um, Not all carbon. <laughs> yeah, effectively, I've just created an oven, was cooking, cooking uh, rotten meat and a lot of other things. So the Jura moved to my allotment where it still does a great job. Um, uh, we then, by this stage, we'd got together with eight different businesses in Froome who were prepared to pay us to collect their food waste. This is Lungi Barbers. The guy on the right is Mahesh, who runs an Indian uh, restaurant, which is our probably the largest quantity and most compostable um, of what we collect. So this, you know, by the time the students had finished, um, we had, as I say, we're probably, uh, might be 10 now. Anyway, there's eight organisations who, who um, give us food waste and we now chuck it into that, which is the RIDAM, which Nikki had a, a lot um, to do with helping design, which we moved to, although it's significantly more expensive, I'd raised 10 grand by then um, from a local trust, which meant we could afford this. Um, uh, the, I mean, from it's got many advantages. The main one is being, I think, is being able to stick stuff in that term at one end and get it out at the other. It's taken us a fair while to work out how to do it, how to how to get a decent flow, a decent and regular flow through it. I would say, um, and that's partly related to the quant, the, the quant, well, the quality and the wetness of stuff we're getting, but then also a mixture those yellow. So, um, uh, you know, sand, uh, what are they, salt and sand buckets at the back we, we use for keeping um, wood chip and wood shavings in, but it's been hard to get uh, a nice non-MDF wood shape, nice dry non-MDF wood, wood shavings. Anyway, we've just about got it. We're five months into this now. And then uh, just like in the picture um, that Tom showed just now, uh, where we're putting the, the, the initial product that comes out after about two and a half weeks. So it's only two and a half weeks in the ride and then it goes into those metal, um, what you, I don't know what you call them, baskets effectively. So mesh basket, mm. which have got a bit of carbon over the top to keep the, um, the dampness in. On the right hand side, is, this is in, the, in Froome's uh, municipal park. So on the right hand side is sort of traditional composting. And what we're turning that into is sort of compost central. It's a place where people can come and learn about compost. And then I think I've got another photo, yeah. So after, this is sort of breaking down the first of those compost uh, mesh cages. And then I've been putting it into, or we've been putting it into um, that left hand bin to, to do a bit more maturing with worms, mm. uh, which is our sitting. You can kind of see in that one of the, one of the things we've failed, we've got wrong, I think is we've had it way too dry. I broke another one down today and, and, and then I was put a lot more water on both in both for the compost and more particularly for the worms, we've had it way too dry, I'd say. So we're, we're still very much learning as we go along. Um, I definitely agree with Danny or Danny's point about keeping, keeping the size small helps a lot. I think, I mean, you know, the under 10 uh, tons thing, we're definitely moving towards. And then we have, we're, we've got two satellites starting to um, cre create themselves and get funding, one at the health center and another um, at another charity within Froome. Um, so keeping sort of small and satelliting seems the way to go. I'll be fascinated to see how people get around selling um, because I think that takes you, it, well, potentially it takes you into a whole load of legislation um, if you want to you know, actually bag it up and sell it as compost. Um, if, you're, if you're giving it back to people or finding some way to get around that whereby you're, you're donating it, well, you're giving it to them and then they're making a voluntary donation, I think there'll be ways around it. But we, we really want to, you know, we need to learn from each other on that, I think, because mm. I really don't want to get to, to excessive testing. Now, let me see if, if I stop sharing that screen. Uh, let me see if I can. Sorry, if I do share, see if I can just share another. Uh, oh, that's interesting. OK, I now do share screen. I want to share one other thing before I finish. Um, the carbon calculator. Yeah. Can you see that? Game changer, yeah. OK, so these are our customers along there, Lungi Barber, Sweet Pea, blah, 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 along the road. So each customer, I'm very happy to share this with anybody um, as, a, as a template. You could just take it out, take out the customers and put it in your own. So if we take somebody like, say, Lungi Barber, who's the, uh, where am I? Uh, if I click on that, yeah. So this is actually not nearly as complicated as it looks. It's um, 
once set up, so it's, uh, um, so this is the, the Indian um, guy who I mentioned before, all you need to fill in when you're <clears throat> off doing something is sort of how many buckets you've, uh, you've collected at, uh, you know, the size of them, plonk that in and, oh, I've filled it up in, in a silly place. Oh, that, that's yeah. literage, is it? That's litres of food waste. Yeah, uh, sorry, that, that place won't work really because it um, doesn't got the figures in underneath. I do that one. Yeah, so then all these happen automatically, which is the waste volume, the wood added, the Rydan volume, which is the total, um, the weight in kilograms, which I've got, I got that off a standard UN, I mean, some pretty, I mean, there, there were good references off this and the CO2, um, it comes off that. And then um, you get monthly totals. We need monthly totals because the way we're working this is that customers pay by direct debit on a number of, on, we've got three packages, sort of large, small, medium and large, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you pick up one bucket every two weeks, uh, one a week or two a week, and they pay differently. So I just we just need to check monthly whether they're way over the top. And if they're way over the top, we charge them a bit more. Yeah. You sort of go card list, which makes that really easy to charge more. Nice. I realize I'm talking really fast, but I'm really happy to to share all this later with anybody bilaterally or via Tom. And then all of all of those different pages um, at the bottom, I think they're called pages, aren't they? all mm -hmm. come into a summary at the beginning. So there, there are the different, you know, that those are all all of the different um, customers. And then you, and then we get a total, a running total there. So this is actually, uh, the one I'm looking at isn't the, we keep one in Google. This isn't the most recent by any means. This is about a month ago. So at that point we collected um, nearly five tons of weight um, and saved um, roughly that many tons of um, uh, CO2 equivalent. Which is, which is one of the things we're sharing, which kind of telling people, because what we're trying to do is really build a relationship with those customers, by which they're really brought on board. They have a page, you know, they have a bit on our website, they have pictures, they're going into our social media because we're charging, they are paying more than they would be paying from the standard uh, people who are going to take it away, drive it to the other side of Somerset and burn it. Um, <laughs> uh, but they're not, not a lot more, but a bit more. So as far as we're concerned, they've, they've got to clearly feel that they're part of a family, that they're doing this for the right reasons, that we recognize them. So being able to say to them, you know, um, uh, whoever they are, well, that's not a very good example. Um, you know, so last month, you, um, you know, you saved 169 uh, kilograms of, of carbon, which, which, you know, does something or other. I mm. think so. so as I say, I'm really happy to just, I can just send you this spreadsheet and you could just blank out all the, well, basically, if you just if you just turn all those all those numbers into noughts, um, you know the, the whole lot will um, uh, you, you know will will all it'll all disappear um, underneath. See what I mean? And then one could put in whatever you wanted, and then obviously the date. So and as long as you didn't touch any, well, I mean, as long as you didn't fiddle with the rest. I mean, if somebody knows what they're doing with spreadsheets, they can do what they like with it. But it would allow you to um, uh, to get out to get the answer out, you know, to get those those figures out at the end. And I researched those sort of the CO2 equivalents things quite carefully. I could tell you where those came from. I've forgotten at the moment, but um, um, I think that's the main things. Um, we we still feel we're very much learning. It's basically it just about breaks even. We pay for the we pay people to go and do the collection, um, and in the end, uh, we were going to well, basically the trike the loop room rents one of the trikes from me. Um, eventually when we get enough money we'll um uh we'll it'll you know the cic will buy the trike off me but we haven't got enough money at the moment and i don't mind cont continuing to own it because actually i love trikes I'm <laughs> you love composting and you love trikes <laughs> um, so uh so there Thank we you, are Peter. that was brilliant absolutely wicked i look forward to seeing more uh getting in, into that looking more into that spreadsheet um because I, I don't know how that like whether that just accounts for like emissions saved from the big vehicles collecting it and how far it would otherwise have to go, like the haulage savings, or whether, how do they calculate, like whether it's me, you know, cause it, in, in a lot of these places it's, it's methane or nitrous oxide, which are greenhouse gases that are, you know, 28 or 250 times worse than CO2. Um, yeah, it, it's cruder than that, I'm afraid, Tom. It's, it's simply, um, what would have happened if that if that waste was um was landfilled rather than uh was rather than composted 
So by fixing it into nitrate into um, into carbon versus um, if it had just been chucked in the it had been chucked in the bin, if you see what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a great start. There's another uh, company that uh, Artist Draw Cider that I know have um, they've got a, uh, their their cider maker Tom is a is a quantum physicist and and, and he's 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 put, put some real energy and time into a spreadsheet. So it might be um we get to find out how they did theirs to see if there's a sort of like any tweaks that could be made to yeah. get it more accurate. Um, but they've yeah they've calculated the cost per bottle of their cider, and different ciders have different footprint, which is interesting um yeah um yeah great so such good step forward uh, and, and one that i think we could all be doing and yeah and then yeah like you say building that brand like you know loop approved you kind of you want like a window sticker that you can sort of give to your companies that then say you know just saving carbon with loop and all that that kind of stuff because that's what they're buying isn't it um and that's how you can add your add value and still make but yeah, as for the the selling compost bit, let's chat about that at the end because um, I'm I think Tom might have something in, some interesting insight there, but I don't think it's as hard as we're making out because with a microscope and it's not that hard to prove that you don't have pathogens. Um, but yeah, let's have a chat about that at the end because um, if you've got the beneficial organisms, compost is worth a lot of money. <laughs> so yeah exciting that was great danny thanks for coming um we'll 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 share the the recording with you dude brilliant thank you thanks everyone that was really interesting and yeah definitely up for kind of uh looking at that spreadsheet peter and having a go with it see you all cheers soon. danny bye -bye. Nice one, mate. see you okay have we got has everyone that was meant to talk uh speak uh, speak spoken i think we have done it um i how's everyone doing for energy i could share some slides um but i'm aware we've all spent a good hour i think focusing and um i could also equally do it another time um but well, we could get onto question and answers now that might be more helpful for us as a group um what do you think i was going to share i thought i'd just share this video um, me and Danny put together. It's very last minute um, when, when he said get together the the funding document um, for the John Lewis Fund. Um, I'll just share my screen because uh, you might be interested. It's only a minute, and it was very light, rushed, really. But um, I, I, I did actually use it in a presentation I gave recently, where I only had five minutes to influence some civil servants about this because they. So some civil servants, this is quite good news, actually. They're really, one of my composting, one of our composting members in Brighton uh, ended up working for, um, works for the civil service and helps to um, get, uh, organize a panel on climate change. So she asked me to do a little presentation and I, I chose that as the title because I think that's the kind of, um, the vision that I've really committed to um, and I really believe in with, with all of this work. It's like combining that community element, like, you know, compost bringing people together to take their resources back into their own hands and create local jobs and local facility and local ecosystem health, um, combined with the sort of knowledge of the soil food web, which is really like what's storing most of our carbon. Um, and I feel is like the most sort of long-term sustainable solution to, uh, climate um, breakdown. We just let this cat out, he's being annoying. Okay. Um, I was just gonna um, share this video. It's because this is a minute long um, and it was a, a sort of lesson to how to, how we could improve, but this has tried to encapsulate our, the vision of how ultra soil can maybe support different compost clubs um, and different uh, compost makers. So here, here, here we go. Hello, my name is Thomas Daniel and I'm the director of Altry Soil. Altry Soil is the non-profit set up in... Just realised you maybe don't have sound, so I haven't shared it on that. Yeah, we had sound, I had sound. You had sound? Share computer sound. Okay. I'll uh, get back to that in a sec. Hello, my name is Thomas Daniel, and I'm the soil is the non-profit set up in the first lockdown of 2020 to deal with the two massive problems of everywhere running out of 
compost that's good enough to grow healthy food and the food waste crisis of most of our precious nutrients being sent to landfill or incineration. So we started Compost Club to collect food waste using reusable buckets from people's doorsteps every three weeks and compost it in these compost cups. The complete local composting is made possible by insulated compost tumblers which capture the heat created by the decomposition to kill all human pathogens and allow any food waste including cooked food to be composted along with local carbon. And then you've got softwood, pine and that's a bit large. We've developed a model to create living wage employment from community composting. Complete local hot composting. And we're going to be working with Bristol Living Soil to replicate this across Bristol. The model eliminates the wasteful carbon emissions of transporting heavy nutrients in and out of the city, not just by harnessing renewable energy technologies, but by working with the beneficial microorganisms such as earthworms and fungi, as well as providing the richest food and habitat for our essential wildlife. The regional compost stations create surpluses of valuable compost that can either be donated to community gardens for common good or sold to local gardeners to grow the enterprise. Every springtime, members receive some of the full biology compost to nourish their gardens or houseplants and feed the living soil where they live. Quality and value are determined by presence of the soil food web microorganisms, which can easily be tested with a microscope, as well as the colour and visible abundance of life. Community composting is the most beneficial kind of nutrient cycling there is, wasting no energy from cradle to cradle and bringing people together in a spirit of cooperation and shared purpose. Our role is to provide the appropriate infrastructure, training and ongoing support so that compost clubs can emerge place by place and create their own closed loops. Our intention is to operate like fungi in a forest, sharing essential nutrients and information through the wood wide web to eliminate organic waste and feed the soil. It was uh, made on a Sunday afternoon just with footage, clips and photos and stuff we already had. Um, but yeah, it was. It's uh, it says says quite a lot in a minute. So um, I shared that with these government people and some slides about Charles Dowding's and soil organic matter and the importance of um, sequestering that and this this all of this stuff I've been reading into about how it's not going to take that much in improving increasing our soil our soil organic matter can really um, halt the annual increase of CO two in the atmosphere. But all of it's only going to work if we can get farms to adopt no dig um, and put cover crops in and sort of partner as community composters that are supplying not just our cities but our surrounding farmland with um, with compost. That 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 can do 2.5 per 0.25 percent organic matter a year, but cover crops can do 0.4 percent a year. So really, to draw down the carbon, we're going to need both everywhere. Um, I told them to, that they needed to change the law about, look at this amazing footage that, that I got sent. This is a, this is the bacteria floating inside an amoeba. Um, I told the government, I told these people about the them of the hot composting movement in America and how they, they were doing it in huge heaps like this and uh, running really profitable businesses, regenerating, helping farmers regenerate their soils. Um, and uh, and mentioned the 10 ton outdoor composting limit um, as being something that we needed needed revisiting and they they they, they were really uh, they seemed open to that um in the comments uh, i told them about yeah how wasteful it is to, to 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 reduce biodiversity by composting like this indoors um and i shared with them a little bit of what i know about the difference between you know industrial compost or dirt compared to healthy soil in terms of the absence of the organisms that literally glue the earth together. Um, I told them to look at these policies and consider them. And um, but then the the yeah, this 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 wasn't in the talk. That was the conclusion of that. Um, I, I did quote the links. Oh, I haven't added the slide here, but I I, I quoted composting in the community network um, and soil smiths and uh, others in my sort of uh, reference sheet at the end. Um, uh, as places these these officials could look and um, yeah basically just encourage those policies um, but then I wanted to share these last two with you guys because um, this I've, I've shared this slide before but it's um, 
what I'm learning, the more YouTubing I'm doing on all these, this stuff, is that the, the fungal density, Tom will book, uh, I think, vouch for this, the fungal density that makes compost so, can, you know, so much, so valuable considering the state of most of our land is, um, which is all bacteri bacterially dominated, selecting for weeds, is um, fungi is best achieved with this method of Johnson Sioux composting. And this is a complete game changer because it's nothing like we're doing with the tumblers um, and the food waste that we're collecting, which is creating very nutrient dense, um, bio rich compost. This is creating, I guess it's, you, you don't even need to use food waste for this at all. You can just use wood chips. You can just soak wood chips in rainwater, as I think I'm right, and leave them for two years. Maybe pro probably adding some other nutrient sources is beneficial, but as long as you get this access to air, either with one big tube in the middle or with several little tubes, you get the set, you figure out the same amount of air and you leave it for a year on a pallet, uh, and you leave it for two years, right, um, on a pallet, you get the fungal biomass, which makes the compost really, really valuable. Um, and I know that that's what they have done in, um, and Tom it was involved in these, um, in these trials with the soil um, ecology lab. And I'd like, like to hear a bit more about uh, that. that. Um, but we were the, some of the first, well, I think the first compost makers to, who, who have plans to sell our compost to use the goop, because the, the lesson of the story here is that what, 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 what Daniel was saying um, coincided with what I learned. Uh, I, was, I had learned from the microscope work that we'd already done, which is that the compost we've been making with the tumblers, it was really high in protozoa and bacterial feeding nematodes, which, um, yeah, they're good. They're really good. They eat, um, they eat the bacteria and that makes the nutrients available. That's what makes the plants happy. But it was, it, 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 it was low in um, fungi, um, fungal biomass compared to bacteria which which was which was bad and it didn't have any other kinds of nematodes so it was it's although it's a very valuable as a worm compost already vermi compost is still really valuable um it wasn't sort of the holy grail which um which we've hopefully done by adding this this product we bought a liter of it um, and uh, Daniel very kindly agreed to give all of us who are part of this um, community a 20% discount. So I can give you guys a code for that if you ever want to try it. But we're basically getting it tested um, this, this weekend. We are going to be testing how many of the bays we've got, how much, how many more nematodes and fungi we've got compared to our first bay. So that's really the most interesting thing um, going on down here at the moment is... Um, yeah, have a look. There's that's that's some amazing imagery from these guys um, from Soil Smith Soil Ecology Lab. Like that 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 figure top from below is a a, a, a nematode trapping fungus. It's what happens when the nematodes get too big for their boots. The fungi start trapping them and digesting them like that. So another way, like fungi are kind of become top predators. Um, amazing ecosystem complexity um but yeah let's open this up now that was the, all, the, all i really wanted to say um and tom did i say some horrendous errors there in my um in my summarizing of complex science no i think you you did a good job um it's great to see some of the pictures that we used um presented to the government like that so well done no worries nice one yeah, it's um, it's really uh, it's really interesting. I shared with them this slide, and I think that got the message across quite well. Um, like, yeah, this is the system. One of them said in the comments that this is this is the kind of thing the government have uh, that local government or have been trying to do for years. Um, and they were like, they were asked, they were saying really positive things like, how can we support? Like, how could we support this and things like that? And it's just like that's why I brought up. Um, this idea of national gardening leave it's this policy that the new economics foundation wrote about 12 15 years ago but it's such a good idea it would just be for regular holidays regular bank holidays where everybody gets the day off to garden together um and i just think that would be so revolutionary for making all of this this kind of work really viable because it is hard because we are trying to money, we're trying to make we all have to pay the rent we have to make a living so you have to monetize these community relationships a bit which isn't very um helpful some in some ways but it's also 
it also can be great if you like if you can find these things like people that yeah meet meet these sort of needs um i think it it, 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 it is sort of working and i shared this slide with you guys and saying how we were building a network and that uh, our idea was that we could produce compost to such high quality it, everywhere that it could be supplied locally anywhere and um yeah so that's 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 that um should we have a look at the questions um any any other qu any questions directly just um from all of those brilliant talks or um yeah hannah yeah, hi. Um, one for Peter, actually. I was interested, um, you were talking about satellites and um, getting those kind of started. I know you haven't got them up and running maybe yet, but um, I'm interested to know um, what the structure will be un like under the kind of umbrella of um, Loop Froom. Will the satellites be kind of um, managing and creating their own kind of um, their own compost and selling it, or do they um, contribute the the output to the kind of whole of uh, loop frooms output and then you sell it under loop room so the, so the model we have at the moment is that they're they are independent they're making their own but they're paying us actually it was so tom shared with me a budget um for one you'd done tom where you you'd gone out somebody fundraised using a budget which you you sent me if you remember anyway um, yeah i do I, I can share that yeah yeah so, so um so that included money it's got uh that um i think it's 700 quid for for us basically so so loop will have a contract to um to help get the things or to help set the thing up and then to provide the wood they call in regularly to basically provide the wood chip and see if it's working because our kind of feeling is that that's what people need once it gets started someone needs to go past but it's quite easy for us because we're going around moving around collecting stuff anyway mm. so um so sort of pop in you know give it a stir see if it's working and that kind of thing and then also top up the the the, um, the wood so that's that's the plan but definitely that they will be independent because i don't want to we don't want to deal with their product really <laughs> <laughs> and have they got um rydans or have they got um the jurors so in both both the cases we're looking at, one of which is um, something called Fair Froom, which works with uh, uh, the food bank. So they get an excess food um, that they want to uh, compost. And then the other is um, a load of kind of allotments which are connected to the, the health centre. So the, uh, the answer, sorry, the answer is jurors. Mm, okay. so it's a small enough scale, probably possibly two jurors, um, even from even from the off at the health centre. So they've got four different, because the, the problem with the juror is, is you know, the one's, one's full, you know it's like what do you do with the staff and so yeah. hence the need to possibly expand whereas the right end doesn't have that uh you know you're in one end and at the other so you can uh it's interesting that you you're working with like established organizations so it's essentially as a satellite they've already got that kind of infrastructure where they can organize and manage that whole system themselves rather than creating a community group which is there's interest from various different areas of our community who are kind of saying yes we, we were interested and we're saying to them okay well if you can get 12 households together we can try and work out and get you the uh juror but i don't think that they, they i think they'd need a lot more support so um yeah it's interesting anyway mm. thanks that's great cool i think, I think the, uh, the the thing to bear in mind is that uh, we did some ran the figures on on the comparison between the different jurors and the and the rydans and you basically you have to each each situation is different so you need to do a bit of a case study on each one because if you're if you're producing you know hundreds hundreds of kilos of uh, a, a week or whatever it is you you a jaw is not going to be big enough and you want to you want to use a ride down so you've got to match the the the, the sit, each situation up this, this yeah. is what we, did when we went around to the schools you know i just want to share add to the back of that nikki had a real um close sort of yeah encounter of that recently um with these trials of three jurors that the food partnership have put out there and uh it's the different the difference is just like if it's 60 50 60 liters extra food waste a month the juror becomes not 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 great for um for some for some locations especially where like rats can't be tolerated at all because people put too much through it it doesn't break down um in the time frame there's still too much undigested food and then it goes out and then before you know it there's 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 rats that have crawled all over it and it's and, um and the other and the other thing to bear in mind is that you know there, there are different systems for different places so we work with for instance with high rise in london and hackney 
uh, where they use they gave Bakashi to all the flat owners of the flats because the Bakashi system, uh, well, the Bakashi itself was really good be, at, at deterring rats and, and, and other pests and things. Um, so even though what might not have been the best composting system, mm. it was the best collection system. So after it was collected, it then went into a they actually in that case it went into a rocket, which is a which is like a you know a mechanized ride if you like. Are you just <laughs> you know, a big in the bottom? You're not in, in, you're not kind of asking people to do the extra effort of layering up the bakashi with every kind of deposit in the bucket. It's just one bit at the bottom. I have started doing that, Hannah, on the on the last collection round for everyone that stores their bucket inside because I was worried that we were gonna I have actually seen some rats. I mean they've always been here where we, where we are in Lewis, but um yeah I don't it's it I'm I'm worried that we're attracting rats. So even though we're we're on, we're on a three week cycle. So yeah, basically I messaged everyone in our WhatsApp group and said, if you're up for doing this, um, using this Picashi, I just gave them a pot. I actually had loads of pots from an old uh, an old thing. And I've, I've given them a, four, a 500 mil pot of Picashi to put in, to sprinkle in with their bucket. You know, that's it's not costing me very much. And I'm, the trial that I'm doing is um, figuring out if that means I can do a collection every four weeks from these households, um, which would mean seven less collections a year which would save, you know, probably like 100 litres of fuel if I was using a van, um, which I'm not at the moment, but um, oh, the, the fuel economy is huge. I did a collection round with my friend's pickup truck and it looked really fit for purpose, but I calculated how much fuel we used just driving around Brighton. And then I had to go to Burgess Hill because I've got three there, which is like 10 miles north of Brighton. Um, we used... 16 litres of diesel just to get 35 buckets of food waste together, um, which is an awful lot of carbon and didn't feel very good. Um, whereas when, when I had my van, it was 45 miles to the gallon and it's, you know, like eight litres, like seven litres of diesel, um, 50, 10, 15 quid didn't feel like that, that big a deal. But suddenly it starts feeling like you're not actually yeah it's problematic to say the least so all the, these local composting stations like peter was saying calling them satellites of that, that i think that's a really good way to go and knowing what system to recommend people that's kind of how i'm wishing to grow our kind of compost compost club is supporting people to 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 to, to, to have their own really good composting system um and and make that the club rather than you know actually collecting food waste is a lot of it's always going to be a huge a huge operation because it's so heavy it's one of the heaviest things you can move it's like 80 percent water um so it's got to be as local as possible and i like i like delivering carbon to these compost stations i provide a service doing that i i've, I'm, I've been undercharging i think um but i do get paid i do have three client three three compost stations that pay me 1250 a month to deliver them like 100 liters of carbon a month um 1250 for like 100 120 liters of carbon um but you can fit that on a bike trailer no problem um and it's much nicer to carry that a set more satisfied to carry that carbon free than food waste yeah um but yeah the the, the number on jurors is i think it's if you've got to find out if someone's getting if they're producing more than 240 liters of food waste a month because yeah, if they're producing more than that, 240, 250 litres max, then I would consider looking at another uh, another drawer or, or, or quoting for two, for two, you can either look, either look at a ride and or quote for two drawers. So I've got one, um, one place now that have got, uh, they're, they're the, a, bit, a business and they've got two, um, five, uh, two of the 270 litre drawers, and that's working because there's four compartments. So there's always been one compartment that's been there for like enough time. It makes all the difference having four compartments. So yeah, I can get the 270s as well. They're, they're like, um, yeah, pretty much half the price, um, but they're not half the volume. So they might might be looking worth looking into those um, if, if, pay, if, if for, more for businesses or places where you really couldn't tolerate a rat. Um, whereas if it's, you know, in the, if it's somewhere really rural then it's like it's part of the ecosystem kind of thing but um mice we mice we saw lots of mice in the compost station yesterday got a great video of them they're, um, they're always 
always welcome in my opinion because they uh they nib they nibble people's they nibble the bones from people's food waste they 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 turn the bones into bioavailable um phosphorus apparently Pretty cool we're, we're Tom we're we're um we're heading towards 200 liters a week of food waste with the rider maybe 180 and that's uh, what you're, you're getting through it with the rider yeah of food waste so and then half again so same again of wood so so heading towards it wouldn't be 500 be more be be sort of 400 liters of stuff at least going really through. worth it is you are getting that so four, at least four times as much as a, a big juror amazing yeah. and it costs it, it costs three people, times as it costs it costs nearly four times as much though doesn't it yeah 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 so it's four grand to buy the thing and um yeah uh, um but it's i mean uh, uh, sometimes you get it wrong and things come out the other end you kind of thinking especially things which we're trying to persuade people not to put in whole aubergines whole cabbages you know whole baked potatoes and things that come out the other end exactly wrong. getting people to chop up potatoes and crush eggshells would be so good for the for the quality of the compost um yeah chopping up potatoes the amount of potatoes it's no good I think that I think I already mentioned, sorry, really quickly, somebody said, I said, I have no idea how long this stuff takes to go through. And they said, put in a couple of golf balls, which is brilliant. So we put in, you know, a couple of golf balls into the yeah. beginning of the ride down. And then, you know, two and a half weeks later, that's how I know it's two and a half weeks. I've got some yellow ones and some white ones. And I kind of check nice. it out. Nice. Yeah. Good idea. That's there a really are, good idea. Um, there are, I did, I did this little booklet for uh, schools and we did do a kind of comparison of, so, on the Rydan page, there are actually three different si uh, sizes of Rydan. I wouldn't go for the small one, but the, the mini. But there's a standard Rydan and a large Rydan. And the standard will take up to, according to this, 75 kilos a week. And the large Rydan, 200 kilos a week of food waste, that is. Whereas the, the, the small uh, Jura uh, only takes 15 kilos a week that's the very smallest juror though that's isn't the it? two that's the 270 oh really really it says it only takes 15 kilos a week uh that's what we that's what we reckon i mean you you've you've done more with jurors than i than i have done i mean we we found the jurors the the, the challenge with the there's a lot more work with the juror and because you can't fill them up of course you know you have to have that tumbling well you can't fill up the rider either but i mean you have to have that tumbling space don't you and it's much more important with a with the jaw than the, than the rider in a way uh, and so there's a lot more handling with it um we found they have improved the design since i first started the, the design was was appalling in the early days it all used to fall apart all the time oh, really the 900 the, the jaw 900 is much much bigger isn't it i mean it takes up a lot more space i haven't seen the um, 900 is that the one that like the industrial one that has electricity oh, i thought that no no i no, thought that's the, what you were aren't you using those no we use your J, the jura 400s um they're the they're the standard oh, sorry four, that's what, sorry four, 400 sorry it's four that's okay 400s and 270s um yeah. but I've, I've got a few to the 270s have been uh, pretty good because one thing i have found with the 270s is that there's not so much um uh space in there that uh, basically i think the insulation is is be is, is, is it lasts longer because the problem with the big jurors is that you can put in a mix that's so hot um and too much of it that's why they say don't fill it much above the central bar um because and then i think as peter's done you can end up with some insulation warpage because well, you've got so much well, coffee my, in there, peter. yeah my i had to, i had to scrap my jaw in the end because it all the insulation shrank and it just fell out Oh, it don't just, well. It just pieces. Well, okay. I can I can get the insulation. They send it to me for free, okay. so you can replace it. And I, I that's one thing I think they are worthwhile because the steel frame really that's going to last very very long time. Um, yeah. So replacing the insulation well, is is a job, but it's uh, yeah. it's not that bad really. And and it's and you get a whole other whole other lease of life well, from it's it. Been, it's been scrapped now, sadly, because. Uh, I think that the time the company that was doing it went went into liquidation, then you couldn't get Joris for a while. Right. Um, yeah. And then yeah. Coming direct from Sweden, so anyway, it's all changed again now, isn't it? Yeah. My problem. Just before you go, Hannah. I've got to go. Um, nice one, Hannah. You've just. I've got too so much coffee in. Bad yeah. news. That's how I managed to cook my Jura. Oh, okay. I mean, so, so, how much is too much? Probably fifty percent. Uh, you know, this was from a cafe. 
so yeah. so so I, you know so it was a, it was lots i thought i was, at that point i thought coffee it's brown okay. you know uh -huh. yeah somebody, like, <laughs> like nikki said no no it's berries it may look brown but yeah. it, was wrong in, it was wrong in every sense yeah. and it got really hot it was very exciting yeah <laughs> <laughs> it contracted the insulation so now there's a little crack down inside so i, I put about 10 percent in now coffee i quite like yeah. it, it a bit of that's it. great 10 percent is good isn't it this is the one one part in pen the yeah. um the coffee tends to be a really fast acting high end i find and doesn't seem to have a, a long lasting effect so mm -hmm. it'll shoot up really high it'll pop the pile up really hot so you can you can use it as like a kind of kickstarter for mm. the of the pile. I'd yeah. love to ask these um Nikki and uh, Pete, Peter do you, do you have any experience with compost activators I know Nikki mentioned urine last time um but obviously that's a little bit like can't really be pouring that into like drawers in oh, public yeah. places um yeah but um yeah is there any other ideas of what because I mean I, I say to people that they, that if they if their drawer isn't getting hot just add add a bit of coffee and get the hot, hot microbes going and then um, I've and used QR do you know QR quick return um that was do you know about QR people? no uh there was there was a the legendary composter called May E Bruce so I've got a books up here uh, she basically, what she did was uh, she took the, she followed uh, Steiner. She realized that anyone who wanted to follow the biodynamic practices that Steiner talks about and his, the composting preparations in biodynamic systems uh, is very complicated. You know, you've got, there's, there's a lot of work making those preparations. So she took the, basically the herbs that we use, the, the yarrow and the valerian and so on. There's quite, there's quite a list of them and made these herbal preparations, which you can still buy uh, through, um, we used to get it, you know, when I was at Henry Doubleday's, we used to pack them up, but you can still buy them through Garden Organic. And she called it QR, which stood for quick return. And you and you basically mix up a little, a little bit of that, a teaspoonful of that with some warm water and a little bit of honey and, wow. and get that going and then pour that on your compost heap. Right. Um, and I must say, it did seem to work really, really well, but I never did it in a very scientific way. Mm. Um, but it is the same as the as the five preparations that go on the biodynamic compost systems. Nikki, where um, did you say you could buy that QR? From Garden Organic. I think they still do it on their catalogue. Thank you. Um, but I've, I've, to be honest, I've just always, you know, preached air and water. Yeah. And getting the mix right at the beginning, making but like, sure you've got it yeah enough carbon you've got plenty of carbon and and making sure the moisture levels are high I, enough i have found in general with the jurors there's always like there's always at least a few days over the 60 degree mark when i when i do these mix with 50 percent food waste 50 percent carbon roughly though i haven't mm. been too worried but um recently somebody came with this plastic uh, thing they were making a documentary about a, a, a compostable alternative and they wanted a controlled experiment and i had this really piping hot drawer and we filmed putting it in but then because we turned it and opened it and let a lot of the heat out a couple of days later the whole thing's gone cold and so well that's not a good experiment i guess mm. i should have got him around in the first week of the breakdown when it was definitely going to stay hot but um yeah. Yeah, it's gone gone cold now. I'd like some compost activator too. Well, the whole point, I mean, for me, the whole point of the Jura and the, the Rydan and these tumbling systems is that they accelerate the first part of the composting process. Yeah. yeah. So so that, you know, uh, and, and the Juras are quite a small um, capacity, so volume. So you can't, once, you, once you've heated it for, you know, a few days at that, that kind of temperature, it's not, not going to reheat anymore without adding fresh, kind of more coffee or more grass cutting i mean grass cuttings grass right. cutting is a good show you know yeah. Uh, yeah. things like that uh, are not going to get it's not going to get hot again is it shall we quickly while we've got tom on the call and peter asked that question about selling compost tom would you be able to i mean it, it, are there are there did you learn much for a sell about the laws of selling compost to farmers and to grant to gardeners so um if you wanted to sell compost uh to the public it has to pass um certain regulation standards and i think it's uh, past 100 is the gold standard regulation thing but the problem with that is um most past 100 composts are completely hydroscopic or hydrophobic sorry yeah. and you end up with just really awful compost 
um it -hmm. seems more like a kind of racket like you pay for someone to come and certify you and you have to jump through certain hoops and and they come and see they come and examine your site and go oh yes this is Uh 100 it's like the veolia is it veolia yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but we've, they, you know, we've been we've been we've been selling our compost for um, over twenty years uh, from our community site, uh, and you know, I, I've argued. I mean, I've been up to Westminster several times when we had the Community Composting Network and met with several ministers and talked about it and argued with them uh, constantly. And we bam- and they did bring. Uh, we we argued the fact that as a club, as a club member that the, because part of it is about move, moving materials around from site to site, you know, this thing of spreading viruses around, it's exactly the same kind of thing, right. spreading pathogens around yeah. from site to site. But if you're all, if you're in a club, then you're all, you basically all own the same site. The site is your club. There's, it's this kind of legalese. Crap nice. It. So it's nice. like a, like a private thing going yeah. on as yeah. opposed to a public yeah. yeah so we we managed to argue that quite successfully so we sell our stuff um anyone who buys it from us it automatically joins our club yeah sure. uh, you know so that, that, <laughs> Nikki, you, you put that you put that in a document and we've, we we were inspired by that and that's why we called it compost club because it was like yes we can right. sell the compost to people right. in the club the, the only but thing it, is Nikki. that if it's food waste the food waste side of it um we haven't pushed that and and we we did a small amount of, we've always done food waste as part of our proper job project because it's came from our our community cafe and so we were composting that through a ride down uh, and all the rest of it and there's also but that was also being mixed with human year compost from the compost toilets on site right. so there wasn't any way that anyone was happy about selling a mix of food waste and human manure you know? I, I, i've seen plenty of pathogens in human uh, human your compost before um, sure. So we didn't want to risk. We we couldn't. We never did that. So I was always. I've always been the one that's dug out the uh, the boxes of the human manure and um, food waste compost and bagged it up and just used it myself. You know, uh, because we couldn't sell it, but we but did Nikki, sell the other one. Nikki, if you take the human manure out of that, I mean, so it's just it's food waste and um, I mean, you know, theoretically, mm. uh, it, it it's it, it's food waste and wood chip. And you're yeah. it to members. So are you saying that actually, some, I, so I come along, I've, I've never seen you before in my life. I walk in and I say, oh, look, I'd like to buy that. I'll give you 10 quid. I'm, I'm automatically a member. Do I have to, you know, without giving my name, without my, do I need to go through a process of? No, they of take their, uh, we take, na- we do take names and postcode. Okay. Um, we take that as a matter of course, anyway, as monitoring on our site because we, we claim, we also collect, get, uh, in Devon, they pay us recycling credits and reuse credits because we got bric-a-brac and furniture and all sorts of things on our site. So we get money for tonnages diverted from disposal. So wow. we're getting money for our compost. We get we charge people for the compost. We get money through the recycling credits and we charge people to drop off as well. Yeah. So, yes. um, you know, we're getting paid three times for our compost. That's amazing. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the... Um, on the food waste side, um, because of because food waste is again subdivided down, isn't it? And you've got you've got the ve- vegan food, and you've got uh, dairy and meat included food waste. So they are they are separated out categories within the within the legislation. Sure. Um, and then and then there's the whole business of you know how how whether you can sell or. I, I don't. I don't know. I'm a I bit mean, out of date. I think what's going to happen is it's going to be a bit like um, when my my friend who did uh, mushroom. He he. They they had a mushroom business, espresso mushroom company, and they had they had the authorities come come round, and at the end of the day, they know they've 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 test they 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 know they just know more about the mycelium um, cultures and the different molds and all of their competitors and. Um, and they, they could basically teach the authority how it actually works. And the authority couldn't argue with that because they had they as long as you've got diligence, you've got you've got you've got records. Um, so in our case, I'm thinking going to have I'm going to have these 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 microbial analysis, these qual- microbial analysis of the soil and of, uh, of, of the compost. And if, if, if there are pathogens in it, um, I won't I won't sell it. Um, 
but if it's all the good beneficial organisms i'll t- i'll share that knowledge with any authority and argue that it is totally not just safe but like regenerative to human health yeah. so, so the the fda in america classifies um harmful compost um as having six or more spirochetes or spirilla per drop at five to one dilution so essentially if you're counting more than six of those little wormy things when you look down the microscope in your drop when you do your scan then it's harmful but yeah if you're being less than that then it's supposedly not harmful but I mean, that seems like quite a lot of spirochetes. They're an anaerobic one that you never expect to see in good quality thermal compost. Um, or right, yeah, that? but then if you're, if you're using manure, for example, then yeah, be a manure. Like fecal coliforms can have, can have those spirochetes. And yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's often hard to spot them as well. Um, you're really looking for like a kind of signature uh, motion, like a yeah. kind of vibrating, spiraling motion. And it's... it's they often pop out of little aggregates and you could easily miss them. And so if you're counting three or four, there's probably more. Tom, it would be awesome to have a, like a microscopy session with you in the future. And maybe we could get another couple of, and we could actually have like live microscope cameras and look at be looking at each other's yeah. compost through it. On, all I'd, on. I'd, I'd love to do that. And, and just, just to let everyone know that I'm open to uh, doing microscopy samples. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to send me your compost and I, I could do a full assay on a four ma- major groups of micro- microbes oh, and give you fungal to bacterial biomass ratios and all of that. If you're interested, yeah, um, yeah. I'd love that. And I, I, mean, I was going to say though, that, because yeah. you're only down the road, or um, or, or you know, we could, or you know, or through Tom, we can make contact. I'd, I'd oh, love to. Okay. I've actually yeah. got my dad was an ecologist. I've got his bloody good microscope sitting uh, two meters away from me oh, um, you, know, you know which i hardly ever use but it's a really top end microscope so oh really I need yeah. someone to show me what i'm looking for i think yeah, the, great the, I, I'm, the, the other, the other room, visit visit you peter the other yeah. challenge though i mean uh, the the biggest composting facility in america was shut down um they couldn't sell any of their compost it was nothing it was to do with um, herbicides contamination clopyrrolid and aminopyrrolid contamination and that's been you know uh, now licensed over here which is really bad news for for composters so um particularly in manures if you like manures we've got a double whammy now because those herbicides go right through a cow and can still be active in parts per billion no way so you know that's that's what i'm more worried about that to be honest mm, i think that's more of the risk isn't it the manure compost the manure moving manure is just not going to be worth the risk or the work anymore is there is it compared yeah, to i don't bother i don't have to take i don't use any manure anymore mm. but i use loads of wood chip wood chip yeah. fantastic I love so, it. so over here at, at my new um my new job um we use donkey manure Oh, great. <laughs> um, so it's donkeys on straw and I checked it under the microscope on one of my first days here and I was thoroughly impressed at the fungal biomass ratio oh. so it was sitting at 1200 micrograms per gram yeah. um, which if any of you know is that's really high well there's and, a lot of uh, and, cellulose isn't there in don- donkey and, and pony uh, cellulose pop- and, and ki- it's almost like chitinous material as well mm. so and and the straw it just adds like a really nice fluffy texture yeah, super yeah. aerated yeah. i was measuring the temps um the other day and they were sitting comfortably around 40 50 degrees so not super hot but it's it's donkey act- donkey so, shit where to go let's get donkeys and use yeah. them to tow our I, I was around really as well. it's the donkeys <laughs> that, are, that are producing the good stuff and so we're, okay. we're spreading that on the roses quite comfortably here so um, the Indian Indian potters used a lot of donkey dung in their in their clay because it uh, it lightens the clay and it makes gives it better thermal shock. Ah, uh, interesting. <laughs> I wonder if the the mycelium in that compost is is yeah. adding. Uh, yeah, probably. Is it, or is it just the donkey the donkey manure? Well, it's the cellulose. It's the cellulose when oh. you mix it. It it uh, but it's like paper paper clay cellulose. Oh, yeah. So it it lightens the clay and it and because they're very crude firing methods, basically putting a bon, in a bonfire, it means it doesn't shatter because it, okay. the air the air the 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 capillary action of the cellulose fibers draws the water all out, and it allows the air through. Interesting. So it, it's Brilliant. there's there's kind of 
drawing of the moisture through the yeah. through the fibers of the cellular yeah. Okay. yeah dries More. up clay very effectively um, hey, i've got to go i really yeah. gotta go i've got to eat i haven't eaten yet let's so call I'm, it I'm, it's, I'm, it's got late yeah yeah that's fun okay. thank you so much everyone for sharing it was brilliant thank you. this is, this is yeah. great great to, to meet all of you and I, I look forward to to more calls like this and seeing Good. how we can collaborate yeah i really love the idea of the, the living soil and seeing maybe if we could do something like that over here 100 yeah. percent, yeah. great stuff and then i think that was really valuable join, sharing our join knowledge composting in the community jo everyone join yeah. the composting community network uh, peter's peter's coming to our next call aren't you yeah. just had an invite today yeah brilliant so that's on, okay. on facebook nikki we'll join the group on facebook and i'll join share it around and, yeah and and answer both questions <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice one thanks everyone okay. splendid Bye. i'll send the video with you soon Cheers. Bye. Bye, Kat.